Thank you. I'm, I'm honored to be here. It's exciting for me. Um, I was actually flew in last night. I just got here from Washington, D.C. So um, I'm glad Lori mentioned the, um, some legislation. I want to talk to you a little bit about mental health and, and politics, just a little bit. But we'll talk about sleep. We all do it, doing it most of our lives, right? Actually, we're doing it before you were born. You were sleeping before you were ever eating any food, actually. Think about it. Sleeping before you ever breathe, or ever breathe any oxygen. And I got involved working with sleep and um, in adolescence uh, back in the 80s. I'm from New York City, born in New York. And I was in the Bronx at medical school. And I got to uh, visit high schools and junior high schools in the Bronx talking about sleep. And specifically, we had a project uh, looking at association between mood, um, bedtimes, and sleep. And somebody in the 80s had said, maybe there's a link between lack of sleep and, uh, and depressive symptoms. And that's one thing she started looking at in the 80s. And when I found it, the people were like, nah, it's not really there. And it's kind of snowballed gradually over the years. And now we're doing it. Now it's pretty much the standard. But sleep's the most powerful thing that you can do. And the way you sleep is a reflection of your life. Um, brown bats sleep about 17 hours. The zebrafish has uh, now been found to actually have dreaming sleep or something similar to dreaming. So fish actually may dream a little bit. And we're in Monterey, the seals. The, um, do you know how the seals sleep? The way you sleep reflects your life. So the seals, when they're in the water, sleep both halves of, uh, one half of the brain at a time. When they're on the beach, both halves of the brain sleep. But they switch back and forth. And just the paper Science published research came, coming out of here just now on the elephant seals and how they sleep. And they, they do this corkscrewy thing in the water when they go down. So they can deep, deep down, they can dive down for like 30 minutes, and about 10 minutes of that time where they're going down, they're sleeping as they're going down. So the way you sleep reflects your life, and I want to talk a little more about that as we go on. The symbol for sleep medicine, the sleep feel of sleep is this little yin and yang symbol. The mind and the brain, we don't separate them out. Night and the day, it all goes together. So I'm, uh, I trained as a child neurologist. Uh, I, I've never had to do a tracheostomy, but it's been in my mind. Like every now and then I review it in my head. If I had to, what would I do? So if you have to do it, feel the thyroid cartilage here. There's a little gap right there. You pop something right in there. And if you're ever going to have to cut, you always cut vertical, never horizontal, because you don't want to cut the carotid artery. You just cut this way. I've never had to do it, but it's in my head. So if I ever have to do it, because if you, you, know, you can't look it up when you need to do it, right? So that's always stayed in my head. I used to, um, I used to moonlight, um, working in a um, pediatric emergency room to make money on the side when I was doing my neurology training. So I did a lot of emergency room stuff. But the whole time I wanted to just do sleep medicine. And I actually now do sleep medicine at Stanford University since 1983 in the department of psychiatry. So I trained as a child neurologist, and I mostly take care of adults with, um, in the sleep clinic in psychiatry. And we take mostly families, because if one person doesn't sleep, well, it impacts the entire family. And a lot of times when I talk to my adult patients about their sleep issues, it really goes back to adolescence. So I'm really, really honored and thankful for the chance to speak to you folks. Um, the first time I was ever asked to speak at a conference, I spoke for two hours and 45 minutes. So always let me, I'm looking, I'm waiting out for that Elmo. Just let me know when to stop, because I'll keep going. And, I, and I'm going to be here all day. So if you have other things you want to talk about about sleep, please let me know. I'm happy to speak to you guys. For the clinicians in the audience, if you've not diagnosed delayed sleep phase syndrome, you've missed it. It's the most common sleep disorder among teenagers. And for all of you youth, and look it up, the most, um, the most common sleep problem we have among teenagers is not getting enough hours of sleep. But as far as the actual sleep disorder, it's delayed sleep phase syndrome. Manifested by trouble falling asleep, not staying asleep. Most of the adults with insomnia will have trouble staying asleep, especially women after age 50 have a particular problem staying asleep. Um, but Teenagers, it's trouble falling asleep. And a lot of the young adults I see say, oh, they began with trouble falling asleep, but now it's trouble staying asleep. And later it's doc, I have trouble falling asleep, I have trouble only staying asleep. But falling asleep is how it begins, and simply nodding head yes. And this was a group of young adults initially, and then later teenagers, that were found to have what they called atypical depression. What was atypical was that they had trouble falling asleep, not staying asleep. And also, the antidepressants didn't seem to help them. They took the pills and didn't seem to get any better. Turned out that what they had was a timing of sleep problem called delayed sleep phase syndrome, a circadian disorder. And once you corrected the sleep patterns, their mood improved. So if you've not diagnosed these, you've missed it. Whenever you deal with teenagers, how many teenagers are here? About 20% of you guys are teenagers? Yeah, okay. Um, 
Most of you are not getting enough sleep. The Center for Disease Control has actually looked at this. About um, 25, only about 25 percent of you are getting enough sleep. So if you interact with teenagers, you know that they're likely to not be getting enough sleep. The system is making you do this. The system is sleep depriving you. It's not your electronics. It's not nothing else. It's just really society's imposing sleep restriction on you. And it's not just sleep restricting you. It's actually dream depriving you. The bulk of sleep that we get in the early morning hours before we wake up is dreaming sleep. Sleep is not equally distributed. There's different kinds of sleep. We'll talk about that later if we have time. We have uh, dreaming sleep. We have non-dreaming sleep, light, intermediate, deep sleep. But our dreaming sleep, that dominates the last third of the night. So when you wake up early, what you're cutting off is your dreams. So it's a, it's a platitude. You say all the time. How many times have you been in a conference, in a meeting, close, going where somebody says, I want you to follow your dreams. Yet the system does not let you get into your dreams. <laughs> and the first evidence of not getting enough sleep is sleeping in on weekends. Elementary school kids don't sleep in on weekends. Why would they? They sleep satiated. The system is sleep depriving you. And they try to catch up on weekends. If we did this with food, it would be an outrage. If, we said, if your parents said to you, hey, uh, uh, Saturday and Sunday, eat all you can, because Monday through Friday, I'm going to starve you. And then eat again all you can Saturday and Sunday, I'm going to starve you again Monday through Friday. You say, that's ridiculous. But that's what we do with your sleep. Sleeping in indicates that you're not getting enough sleep. You shouldn't have to sleep in. You should not wake up tired. You should wake up feeling refreshed, right? An analogy to this is how people think of cell phones. I've been saying this for a long time. Most of us, if not all of us, have smartphones on us, right? How do you feel if you leave the house but you didn't charge your phone? Uh, what happens if you left the house and didn't charge your phone? You're going to be looking for a charger, right? You're going to be like, where's that charger? Who's got a charger? Asking friends, who's got a charger? And um, if, the, uh, if somebody dares talk to you, call you on the phone instead of text you, you go, should, should I drain my battery? Is it worth it or not? And then when you finally find a charger, if you've been in the situation, and you know somebody's been in a situation, when they finally get a charger, when they plug in their phone, you see them let out a sigh of relief. Ah, okay? <laughs> the phone worked just fine at half a charge, didn't it? The phone was, was functioning just fine at half charge, but it was not at its full potential. And that's what you know. Same thing with sleep, right? You're not at your full potential. The one of the things you're going to learn quickly as a teenager is that you can get by with less sleep. You can get by with less sleep. We're not fragile creatures. You can hold your breath on the water. You can skip a meal. You can get by with less sleep, but you're not doing as well as you could. Okay, sleep, but sleep has functions with an S. In part, it's going to be restore your brain. Something happens that's remarkable. How many times uh, have you been reading, studying something, and you have a deadline, you got to get this work done. He goes, I'm going to stay up all night and work on this. And you hit a wall. You can't get through. You're reading the same thing over and over again. You're not making any progress. You said, so I'm going to go to sleep. And you go to sleep just for a few hours. Pop awake, and all of a sudden, what you couldn't do, you can do. What changed? What is actually happening inside our brains is the question. So it restores these higher quarter functions, but also basic uh, custodial work happens in our sleep. Um, all of you seem very well behaved. It's a nice crowd, right? But you're going to leave some things behind, right? Something may drop on the floor or something. You leave. You come back. It's going to be all cleaned up the next day. Who did that? Right? There's a custodial staff who does this kind of thing. So this kind of thing happens in the background. If you happen to come in, you may see them. But a lot of times the custodial staff are kind of silent in the background, not meant to be noticed. My mom used to clean. Um, we worked in a factory. Uh, so in close, but then she had a second job doing uh, custodial work at a community college. So I'm always very careful when I notice the people doing the cleaning and that kind of stuff, what's happening. Um, anyway, sleep's a paradox. And that's what people have. This is what, what happens is that people don't realize um, this paradox. Sleeping animals can be attacked at any point. So you would think that God, Mother Nature, evolution, natural selection, however you think of these things, you'd get rid of your need for sleep, but you don't. You have to sleep, and all the animals seem to sleep. They've even done jellyfish research. The jellyfish are sleeping. We can talk later how they did those experiments, but the jellyfish are sleeping too. So they're all sleeping. But ultimately, I think sleep is an adaptation to, for humans at least, to a changing world. If you have to deal with the environment that's changing all the time, then uh, you're, learning, you're acquiring information today. So I may say something you might find interesting, but if somebody asks you what color was my shirt, you'll say well, he has a white shirt. But five years from now, you should not remember the color of my shirt. But hopefully something I tell you today, you might remember five years from now. So some things you need to remember, some things you need to forget. And also you want to make a connection uh, between what you learned today and what you've learned in the past. And that processing and that matching seems to occur in our sleep. So sleep, in a way, is the, helps us adapt to the changing world. 
And one of the key things that makes us humans, that makes us better than other animals in some ways, is that we're creative. And the physiology of creativity sometime, someday will be figured out. It's going to tie into sleep. And we, we, now we know that people who are lucid dreamers, people who, some of you have done this. Have you, known, have you ever had a dream, realize a dream's a dream during a dream, lucid dreaming? A lot of young people do that. You tend to be more creative also. That's actually been measured. So good for you. So talk about this is different sleep disorders that I deal with. There's over 88 of them that we deal with. The fun part about being a sleep doctor is that most people get better. It's unusual for my patients not to improve. And you guys will get better too. So first thing happens if you don't get enough sleep, you tend to be irritable and cranky. Too many households begin the day with an argument about waking up on time to go to school and then the day with an argument about going to bed. Don't hit the snooze button anymore, guys. Don't hit the snooze button. It's a bad deal. You're substituting dreaming sleep for light sleep. It's a bad deal. Don't hit the snooze button, right? It's, 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 it's like an example of technology that every phone has, but nobody's ever done any research whether it was useful or not. It's not a good thing to do. Don't do that. But I want you to be able to go to bed feeling safe, comfortable, and loved. That's what you really want to do. You want to have serenity in your lives. And if you think about your lives, how you live your life, remember your sleep reflection of your life. When are you alone with your thoughts? When do you do nothing but think? For most of you, it's when it's in bed. But if you don't spend time alone with your thoughts at some point, and you go to bed, you have a podcast on, or music on, or you're reading, and you <clears throat> quote unquote crash, then one of these things that you didn't have, give devoting time to thinking going to show up. They're going to pop awake. And that's why a lot of adults complain about racing thoughts at night, or their mind racing. A lot of people say to me things like, oh, I can't sleep because they can't turn off my brain. Your brain's not meant to be turned off. That's a misconception. The, the sleeping brain is actually a very active brain. It consumes energy while you're sleeping. In fact, your hippocampus, the part of your brain that is used for memory processing, uses up more energy sleeping than in dreaming sleep than when you're awake. For you to see me, I'm reflecting light on you. But for you to have a dream, you got to create all that imagery. It requires more energy. So sleeping is not a passive state. It's an active state. So saying that your problem is you can't turn off your brain is the wrong way of thinking about these things. There should be no doubt that the way you sleep impacts your behavior. And a lot of attention disorders, uh, anxiety disorders, will have sleep components to them and will also mimic sleep disorders. You have my slides. One of the things that we know about sleeping is that when you don't get enough sleep, not only are you irritable, but you're also impulsive. Lack of sleep makes you impulsive. It interferes with your judgment. And it actually, that's not a bug, that's a feature. Our brains are wired to do that. It's in our DNA because if you are in any kind of danger, then you're going to avoid sleeping. And if you're not sleeping, it must mean something is wrong. And if something is wrong, you must take a chance. So sleep deprivation physiologically leads to impulsive behavior. Um, but that can go in the wrong direction. In casinos, they know this. The longer you stay there, the bigger, bet, the bigger mistakes you'll make. They've done this with teenagers, by the way. And they found that lack of sleep exaggerates what it's underlined, the normative imbalance between affective and cognitive disorders. So you, what that means is when you are sleep deprived, you undervalue the risks and overvalue the rewards. It makes you more impulsive. And in, um, we have people who know this much better than I do, but in the Palo Alto, when we had a bunch of kids who died, uh, threw themselves in front of trains, that was an impulsive act, right? It was not just... Uh, mood issues, and mood is very important, obviously, uh, but we also know that lack of sleep by itself is an independent risk factor for suicidal thinking and suicidal behavior, independent of your mood. There's a paper, you can look at it. Over half a million people were included in the study. So it's independent risk factor, separate from just having depression. So somebody, well, you're not sleeping, well, you must be depressed. Yeah, you may be depressed, but you can also have problems just from not getting enough hours of sleep. So I mentioned before, Daniel, thank you for the introduction. Um, again, thank you. Um, California passed the first law in the nation to protect sleep uh, adolescents, the sleep of adolescents. And specifically what was found was that if you allow somebody to get more sleep, start school later, get more sleep, they do better in school, improves their mood. And then on this for over 20 years, so individual school districts would change the schedules, but the problem was that other school districts wouldn't change and the, and the school schedules would not align, especially with sports. So the decision was made to go statewide. I want to talk to you a little bit more about this, because this was just implemented for the first time this school year. 
So the law now says in California, high school, public high schools cannot start before 8.30 in the morning, and middle schools cannot start before 8. There's an exception for rural school districts. We can talk more about that. But I'll let you know how this played out. Um, especially those of you who think that, you know, what can one person do? There was a writer who wrote an op-ed piece in the LA Times, wrote a column, an op-ed piece in the LA Times, and spoke about how lack of sleep and delaying school start, lack of sleep was impacting mental health in teenagers, and that changing school start times could reverse that process. We talk a lot about healthcare disparities. Changing um, school start times has been shown to improve the uh, standardized scores of schools that are in lower performing districts move up once you change the school start times. So this lady, uh, Lisa Lewis, she wrote this op-ed piece. And a California state senator, Senator Anthony Portentino, read the column. He just read the column. He introduced the bill. So a guy in, in, in the California legislator read this one piece, proposed a law, a single sentence. It got defeated right away. It was introduced again, and it didn't make it out of the assembly. Introduced it a third, a set, another time, and it, didn't, um, it made it through the assembly, but it was defeated by the um, moving for local control and by the... Um, by the biggest union in the country. And the biggest union in the state of California was the teachers' union. They were opposed to it, changing the school start times. Um, so Governor Brown vetoed the law. So we had to go again. Every time this happens, you gotta go another, another round. So we went, we went another time, and we went through it, and we passed the entire process, and finally, Governor Brown signed it into law with a three-year implementation. So I was in that process. That took years to go through that, because it's like pushing the rock and you get, it rolls down, but every time we got a little closer. Um, but it turned out when I would, so you have to do all these visits to Sacramento and talk to people. And we had a, a group of angry parents, it was angry motivated parents walking up and down the halls of Sacramento, handing out PDFs of articles without any professional lobbyists, without any fundraising at all, and being opposed by professional lobbyists in, in the state, from the biggest union in, in, uh, um, in our state. And what swayed people's opinion, what made the senators and the legislators change their, their minds was the data on mental health. It was the mental health data specifically that changed their minds. And the reason that Senator Portentino did this um, was because he had a brother that died by suicide. His brother died by suicide, he spoke about it publicly, and that's he was looking for anything that could be involved in mental health. And that's why he took the time to get involved in this. Um, and there was a lot of compromises. It wasn't, you know, it, it, the decisions they make in Sacramento are not always science backed, but at least this time they did. And just a, a little plug um, Senator Portentino is now running for Congress. So he's, he's a state senator, but um, Representative Adam Schiff is now running for the Senate, and uh, Senator Portentino is now running for Congress for his seat. So if you can support him, it'd be great. The American Academy of Sleep Medicine, the organization I work with, I'm on their political action committee. We've actually, for the first time, have actually um, given money for a primary. Usually we give money for the general election, we give money for the primary because we want a friend in Congress who supports sleep and mental health, and we'll have that with them. So that's a little plug. I've never talked about politics like this at a CME conference, so please forgive me if I cross the line. But I think it's important that you have somebody in Congress. You can reach out to him. He understands what we're dealing with. But I was just in Congress um, visiting, and a lot of people were bringing up the mental health issues, and sleep, mental health issues and sleep. It's a real thing. I also work with the National Sleep Foundation. If you're looking for projects and things you want to do, you guys want some data where to look things up. There's a couple of organizations I work with. They'll be in the last slide. Just showing how sleep is divided up into different categories of sleep. Nobody here has ever slept through the night. All of us wake up throughout the night. Sleeping through the night is not true. You all wake up. The issue is going back to sleep. Most of us will, uh, will not remember that we woke up. But when you're sleeping, at the end of every dream, you tend to change body position, and you're briefly awake for a few seconds. He's, that's showing you how the dreaming dominates the last third of the night. For the clinicians and for all of you, if anyone wants to, to get a sense of how somebody sleeps, there's four questions or four areas I go through in my head for every single patient, everybody I talk to. How much sleep do you get? Very obvious, right? The more sleep you get, the better you should feel. But the quality, just so that you can be overweight and malnourished, you can spend many hours in bed and be very, still wake up tired. You should not wake up tired. If somebody says they wake up tired no matter how much sleep they get, then I want to maybe measure their sleep. If somebody says, no, no, um, I'm, I'm, I'm tired when I wake up, but on weekends I can catch up and feel better, then maybe it's just the amount. But if somebody says, no, even on vacation, when you ask them, you got to ask them, goes, well, what about on vacation, spring break? Oh, yeah, I'm still tired when I wake up, now that you ask. Quality issues. Amount quality? 
Timing. Do they take naps? Are they shift workers? Who else in the family? Who sleeps when and where the family, right? Amount, quality, timing. And what would be the fourth component to a sleep history? We're mental health conference, your state of mind. Are you looking forward to sleeping? Are you looking forward to being awake? Do you hate school, right? Are you dreading school, right? Are you in a program that you don't want to be in and it's just, just a drag, you don't want to be there? Or the only time you get to yourself to be with your friends is before you go to bed at night, interact with them. What's your motivation to go to bed? What's your motivation to go to bed? You have to ask these questions. The need for sleep is biological, but the way you sleep is learned. Sleeping is a learned behavior. All of you have learned to sleep a certain way. I got five minutes. No, oh, it's okay. Twice a day we get alert. Twice a day we get drowsy. I'm thankful for a mid-morning uh, chance to speak. That's when we're most alert. Uh, this afternoon you're going to be yawning and thinking of me, I hope. <laughs> this has all been, this is true science. There are genes that, that predict our sleep patterns. Same in flies. The part of your head that measures sleep is the back of your head where the optic nerves cross. This is a practical thing you can do. All of you can do this. A lot of times people sleep, especially for the teenagers, you feel that society is imposing these things on you, and they are, right? So it's out of your control, but how can you be in control? So I use the acronym SELF. I made this up just so I could remember it. And these are things that help you stay in time. If you do these four things at the same time every day, you're going to be in a regular pattern. Your social interactions, exercise, light, and food. Simple way to describe this, if you take a nocturnal animal, take a rat, a wild rat. They're active at night. They're genetically meant to be nocturnal. Right? In the daytime, they hide away. If you take that rat and put it in a cage and only give it food when the lights are on, what does the rat, and you take away the food and lights are off, what does the rat do? It goes hungry at first because it's not supposed to be eating in the daytime. It's nocturnal. But eventually, the need for food will drive it to eat in the daytime. So you make a genetically nocturnal animal behave like a diurnal animal, changing timing of its meals. All of you hear about teenagers that are like, once you one or two o'clock in the morning, I assure you, your last meal is not at six o'clock at night. You're eating late into the night and maybe skipping breakfast. You want to make somebody uh, wake up early? Only feed them in the morning. They'll, that, right, they'll, that'll drive them, okay? But it's also very important not to impose this on teenagers. I want them to understand what they're doing. When I see a teenager for the come in, my first question to them when they say on their parents is, whose idea is it for you to come here today? Do you think you need help or are you being forced to be here today? Let's, put, let's figure it out from your perspective. This is key. This is so important. That's why I use the word self. It's for you to understand how your own body works. You can do this. You, you, look, you look, look at your parents and go, I'm screwed. You know, my, I have horrible DNA. You know, look what I inherited. Right? But your tendencies are not your destiny. And that's an important concept. Right? Your tendencies are not your destiny. Right? So genetically, you are set up to be more active at night. I don't want to skip some of this stuff right now. There's some misconceptions that you're traveling with. One is that this happened a lot. We talk about changing school start times. Uh, a lot of people say, well, the kids are just going to stay up later anyway. They're not going to use up that time. And you could cynically say that, but we're supposed to make decisions based on science. So look at the data. What's happened when they change school districts by an hour, the average teenager slept an extra 40 minutes. Yeah, they did stay up a little bit later, but they got 40 minutes of sleep. It's like saying, I'm not going to feed my kids even though they're starving because they're going to waste the food. That's not true. If you give somebody a chance to get more sleep, if they're sleep deprived, they'll grab that sleep. You cannot make up five days of poor sleep in a two-day weekend. Biologically, the brain doesn't let you do that. The circadian rhythms don't let you do that. If you normally sleep eight hours a night and you skip eight hours one night, you don't sleep 16 the next day. It doesn't work that way. In fact, this has been mentioned in teenagers specifically, that when you lose that one hour of sleep in the spring that we just lost, it takes you five days to get back to your level of alertness that you had before, and you lose about two and a half hours of sleep to adjust back to that one hour time schedule. That's why I want to advise people always ask, you know, what should we do during daylight savings? I say, don't give the kids tests. Avoid, you know, that morning. We know that Monday morning after daylight savings is going to be increased uh, number of car accidents and, and heart attacks among adults. Other misconception. I wish every teacher knew this. A parent knew this. You don't fall asleep because you're bored. That's not what makes you fall asleep. Boredom does not make anybody sleepy. When you were little kids, in your second and third grade, when you were bored, did you say, look, mom, let me go take a nap, I'm bored? <laughs> You're laughing at that, right? It's ridiculous. You look for something to do. 
right? Because second and third graders are sleep satiated. The system does not sleep deprived them the way it does in, in puberty, right? So monotony does not make you sleepy. Monotony means to the brain that you're in a safe environment. And if you're in a safe environment, you can take care of what you need to do. So if you're in a monotonous environment and you're hungry, oh, nothing to do right now, I'm hungry, I'll, I'll go get some food. I'm, I'm in a safe environment, I don't get enough sleep, I'll get some sleep. So what monotony does is unmasks your sleepiness. It unmasks your sleepiness, right? You should not be falling asleep in school if you're getting a full night of sleep. Mark, caffeine is marketed directly to you guys. There's a, and the reason they're doing it is because you guys are buying it. I was just in Congress, I just mentioned that before. I saw something I've never seen before. I saw a Red Bull dispensing machine. Uh, that goes a Red Bull machine next to a Coca-Cola machine. It didn't have any Cokes in it, it only had monster drinks, next to another cold case which had Starbucks in it. So they're all sleep depriving themselves a lot out there. Um, and when you look at movies from the 50s, right? You look at the, you know, what were the teenagers doing in the 50s? Suppose if you look at the movies back then, by the way, in California in the 50s, school started at nine o'clock in the morning, okay? So if you look at the, the, uh, the movies back then, what are the kids doing after school? Dancing around the jukebox, drinking milkshakes. You guys don't do that, right? right. Where do you guys go? Where do, where do the uh, uh, junior high school kids go after school? Coffee houses, only place you're welcome to, right? There's Wi-Fi and the drinks are specifically uh, appealing to you. It's the only place you can start interacting. You start seeing, go to any school, where the school lets out, go to the local coffee place. You're gonna see people filing in. Yeah, that's, that's where they're welcomed. You can get your hands on caffeine as a teenager a lot easier than you can any other drug. You can get a triple espresso at midnight, nobody questions what you're doing or why you're doing that. So marketing is going directly to kids. I was in Target to buy some batteries and I saw this, um, this can just caught my eye. This is 300 milligrams of caffeine. That's more than a cup of coffee, it's more than two cups of coffee. Actually the cheapest way to get caffeine is through energy drinks because it's, it's like a can of this stuff is cheaper than two cups of coffee, okay? So who's buying this? Who, who are they marketing this to? They're doing it because you guys are buying it, and you're buying it because you're sleep deprived. So my wish for you, and thank you for letting me a chance to speak to you, so you get sleep and fully recharge your brains. Some other resources for you, especially school start later. Go to that website. These are all nonprofits, okay? And thank all, thank you. We may have, have time for, anybody have a question, maybe one question that's burning that you really want answered? She, she a hand first, actually. Oh, okay, who, lady, who lady was first? Who the, was first? The, the, the black okay, lady? yes, yeah. okay. Do you want to stand up and say it loud? I'll, I'll run to you. My name is Lizette, I'm from Carmel Unified. Um, I have a question, because I understand the science of sleep, I support the science of sleep, my school district is a rural school district, so we are so far exempt, we're trying to figure out how to make it work. Um, to start school later, but my question and something that I've thought of, I was on the late start committee for my school district to try to figure out how to make it work. You mentioned that it's the system that is not letting teenagers sleep, right? And then you also mentioned that what were teenagers doing in the 1950s? School started at 9 a.m. Um, so this, the state of California is saying school needs to start later because that's what the science says, but the state of California isn't saying we, need to, we can reduce our instructional minutes. It's not saying that we can make any other changes to the system except for starting later. So how do we bridge that gap, that there's still requirements that need to be fulfilled? Our students, so for example, our rural school district, we have kids that get on the bus at 625 in the morning in Kashawa or in Big Sur. If, the, if school starts later, they would then get home, you know, an hour or more later in the evening. That means, like, no family time, no time to do homework at, at home. They may or may not be able to participate in any sports. So it causes a lot of equity issues for students in underserved communities or outlying communities. Again, support the, you know, science of sleep. I support it absolutely. But how do we make it work when the system still has all of these uh, uh, pressures and burdens that need to be... Um, you know, addressed and complied with? The, the shortest answer is go to that website, start school later, and contact them specifically about your school district, and they'll have people come out. Yeah, can you pull, can you pull you it back? Uh, sorry, hello? Specifically, contact start school, start school Later and tell them what's happening in your school district, and people will come out. I can tell what's happening in California. We've had some school districts are trying to get out of the law by reclassifying themselves as rural. This idea of making it rural, making an exception, was not based on any science. It was political expediency at the time to get the votes to get this passed. 
That's why they did it. There's nothing, in, there's nothing biologically different. What's really happening is that public transportation is underfunded in California, and they're trying to use the same buses for everybody, and that's an issue. The RAND Corporation did an analysis. You can look up RAND and sleep and start school later, and they found the state of California would save billions of dollars within five years. Billions of dollars would be saved um, if they just delayed school starting across the state because there was less car accidents around the schools. Yes, you still need to go to school. And if you start school, by the way, the average they were trying to shift is 20 minutes. If you shift schools to start later, school does let out later. But what does that mean when we, this came about? We, interestingly, we were opposed by the California Teachers Union, but what came out in favor of delaying school start times was the Sheriff's Association. Law enforcement came out in favor, why? Because in school districts where they, where they had later uh, time to get out of school, there was less unsupervised time for these kids. So juvenile crime goes down when you have later school start times also. Also, the teachers will tell you that the kids are less impulsive, and better behaved. So um, the main thing to do is just to get it done. Sleeping is more important than your homework. I said it. Sleeping is more important than your homework, okay? And what also has to change is the, is the homework culture, <laughs> right? Because we did homework, we had to just get it done as, as, as kids. But teenagers, they're using social media, and it's the right thing to do for them. They're doing their homework in groups now. They're doing it, they're by themselves, but they're doing it in groups. A lot of your teenagers will spend more hours awake in your bedroom than sleeping in your bedroom, right? Think about the time you spend there. Because they're doing their homework in groups. So they're learning how to interact, and that's the new world. But it takes longer to reach the answers if you're doing it in a group. And, and that's something to, we have to account for. We have to change the way we educate them and incorporate this into it. But you can't have an education system that says, well, you're just going to get less sleep because it's torturing your kids. And, we, and, it's, and it's a problem. Thank you.